The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. My name is Dan Good. I am a programmer. I am not a public speaker. <laughs> so let's just hope for the best. I work for Dell. Uh, Dell actually bought the company where I used to work, which is um, SecureWorks, or where I still work. And we do network intrusion prevention services. But I'm not here for them. I'm not plugging them at all. I'm just letting you know. So I've been doing slinging code, hacking kernels for almost 20 years now. But one thing that I've done pretty much the whole time are regular expressions. I mean, I started using regular expressions uh, back in college, you know, way back when, when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. Okay, yes, a little bit about me. Yes, this is me. That's my picture. It's bad. This is my blog. Um, there's not a lot there, but these slides are there. <laughs> and so are the slides from last year's talk. So last year at Self, I did a talk on um, regular expression practice. And that material was, it was still regular expressions, but it was sort of tips and tricks for advanced hat tricks you can do with regular expressions. I thought this year I'd start from ground zero. Uh, assume people know nothing about them, not even how to spell it, you know, we'll cover all that. And so that's what this talk is. This talk is regular expressions from ground zero. Um, so what is a regular expression? Now this is, this is a definition I found, a compact and expressive notation for describing patterns of text. That's okay, sure, good. This is kind of where I went with that, an instance of the notation used to search strings for matches and optionally make substitutions. And then this is what my wife calls them. How's that? Any better? Sorry. <laughs> Are we having fun yet? <laughs> Line noise. My wife looks at me doing this stuff on my console, and she calls it line noise. And no, she didn't get it from user-friendly. There's a user-friendly comic floating around to that effect. But yeah, it does, it can, can look like line noise. So let's do a little history. 1943, finite automata. Not something we really have to worry about, but theoretically related. 1951, Stephen Claney. Apparently that's how he pronounced it, though I would say Claney. Claney. And Claney proved that regular expressions and finite automata describe the same languages. And this I stole from Russ Cox. He has good regular expression information if you ever want to read any of his stuff. Now, a little bit more history. 1960-something, mid-60s. Ken Thompson, Ken Thompson of Unix fame, wrote a new version of the QED editor for MIT CTSS operating system in 7090 assembly. And what he added to that, which wasn't there before, was regular expressions. And that, I'm not sure if that's a precise teletype that they used, but it is a period correct teletype. So picture that. They edited on paper. They edited over slow serial lines, tackety, tackety, tackety. No full screen for them. So how do you go about editing, I mean, some serious source code on that? Well, you got to have a way to work cleverly with lines. Regular expressions was Ken's answer to this. In 68, he published a paper, regular expression search algorithm, 
This is based off the IBM 7094. He published it in Communications of the ACM. This, uh, this is a very interesting read. If you ever try to read it, um, it actually digs into um, machine code for the 7094. This editor would actually take your regular expressions and compile them into machine code on the fly. So that's pretty heady stuff for, you know, late 60s. So let's try and jump ahead. QED gave rise to the editor ed, ed. That gave rise to the editor x, ex. And thanks to Bill Joy, along came vi. Now, everybody here's heard of vi, right? OK, how many people actually use vi? Oh, yeah, my people, all right. We're good. All right. Now, I just had to indulge myself here. This, this that I'm about to go over with you is a description of regular expressions from a paper published inside Bell Labs in 1970 by Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson. So these are like gods of the Unix world, um, founders, forefathers, whatever you want to call them. And here, here's Dennis Ritchie, in his own words, saying what regular expressions are, how, they, how, do you, how you make them up. And I just, just an homage. I just pulled it out and dropped it right here, because I don't think I can say it better than Dennis Ritchie did. So there's only 10 of these. That's why I call it the top 10. And let's just go over these and bang them out. Um, an ordinary character. An ordinary character matches itself in a regular expression. So the letter A, you do a regex with A in it, it will match an A in your subject string. This is a carrot, that little hat that you find above number six on your keyboard. This is what I call an anchor. Most people call them anchors now. That, when it occurs at the beginning of a regular expression, says that it will only match at the beginning of the string, the beginning of the su uh, subject string. And this is the converse. This is the dollar sign. So the dollar sign, when it occurs at the end of a regular expression, says only match at the end of the line or the end of the subject string. Is this problems again? Sorry. We'll just ditch it. <laughs> I just moved too much. It's the carrot. This is dot. So dot is, um, dot doesn't just match a period. Dot matches actually any character. Dot can match an A, a B, a C, a D, anything. It's dot. And that's very useful. We use that in regular expressions all the time. As a matter of fact, this is probably the most used uh, atom of a regular expression is dot. So you might want to ask the question, what if I really want a real dot in, to match only a real period in my regular expression? What you do there is you escape it. You put a backslash in front of the dot. Okay, now we have character classes and the clean E star. We'll get to that. A character class is just any set of ordinary characters in between two square bra uh, braces, brackets, brackets, we'll say brackets. That's a character class, and it will match any single character from that set in the target string. Then we have a negated character class. If you put a caret as the first character of a character class, that switches the logic. It says match any character that doesn't occur within these square brackets. Here, this is the clean E star. We just you typically call it star. It's a star. This is a repeat. When a star follows a letter, it says match that letter zero or more times. Zero up to any number. So if I say A star, it'll match no A's or one A or two A's and so on. But I can put this star after anything. I can put it after a character class. So if I have a character class that says ABC and I put a star after it, I can match A, A, B, 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 A, A, C, C, you know, and so on and so on and so on. So we're, we're through six. 
Actually, I should watch my watch. I don't, I don't want to run out of time. Now, this doesn't actually introduce any new character, but what this tells us is that we can put regular expressions together. So if dot is a regular expression, and then I have a character class AB, I can put them together. I can have dot followed by the character class of AB. And I can keep doing this, and the regular expression can get longer and longer. That's all that says. This or bar, this is what we call alternation. Or you could call it an or bar, like everybody does. Alternation means or. Let, let me say that better. Um, A or B. A, B, or C, D. Match either one. Dot or not one. All of those are possible with this or bar. I'm going to have to work on that one. <laughs> and then parentheses. So parentheses lets you say, I'll use his example, B or C in parentheses. Without the parentheses, that'd be A, B, or C, D. With the parentheses, it's A followed by B or C followed by D. And the, here, from the very self-same paper, are some examples. So let's try and take a look at these. A, B, C, D. Now here, the slashes, you'll see that a lot. That's kind of historical. The slash in front of and after the regular expression, they aren't really part of the regular expression. They just kind of help you know that we're talking about a regular expression here. It's notation. So slash A, B, C, D will match A, B, C, D anywhere in the target line. A, B, or C, D. Now we have A, B star C matches A with no Bs, with one, with two, any number of Bs. Begin, so the caret in front of this, in front of these regular, non-special, ordinary letters, says only match these at the beginning of the line, and followed by the dollar, only matches end at the end of the line. Here we have caret and a dollar. So this regular expression needs to start and end with those two words, the whole string has to ha start with this and end with that. And it can have anything in the middle, including nothing, because this is dot, and dot, sh dot will match any character. And this is the star, which has zero or more times. So you could have begin followed by a million characters, followed by end, and that would match. Or you could have begin immediately followed by end, and that would match. And here, caret immediately followed by dollar, that will only match an empty line. So no characters can be in here. Here's a character class for the digits, ABC, followed by any single digit. Character class of not the digits, ABC, and then something that's not a digit. Okay. So, so now we know what they are. And we've seen a few of them, and we've got a top 10 list of how to make them. Where are they used? Well, they are used on the command line, as this presentation would have you believe. Grep, Ed, said, awk, pearl, bash. Are those all familiar words to everyone here? All right, that's good. Grep, global regular expression print, that actually comes from Ed. In the ed editor, you can type a G, and then a regular expression, and then P, and it will print all occurrences of that regular expression globally. That's where grep comes from. It actually comes from ed. And said comes from ed. And ed comes from QED, and so it's all tied together. <laughs> Isn't that nice? AUK actually stands for Aho Weinberg and Kernigan, or Weinberger and Kernigan, I'm not sure. <laughs> And the Kernigan is the Kernigan of Kernigan and Ritchie, of Ritchie and Thompson, of all of those great forefathers of Unix. So all of these tools are, are tied together. Now, it's also in text editors. Ed actually is a text editor, even though I put it on the command line. You can use it both ways. EXVI, we mentioned those. Emacs, some of you might use Emacs. I used it for a while. <laughs> it's nothing to be ashamed of. You can be cured. You know? <laughs> 
<laughs> Notepad++. I've heard it's out there, never touched it. Apparently it does support regular expressions. Or if you have a Mac and Apple leaning, I've heard Mac people rave about TextMate, so that apparently is out there, and it apparently also does regular expressions. And then programming languages, nearly all of them. I would have said all of them, but you know, there's got to be something out there that doesn't have it. Snowball, for example, doesn't have it. <laughs> um, C, C++, awk, Perl, Python, Ruby, PHP, JavaScript, Java. There, I read them. Other places, SQL. You guys, this has been a lot of MySQL talks today, right? Did you know you could use regular expressions in your SQL statements? Yeah. So you know like, right? Everybody's seen like, where something like something else. Well, in MySQL, you can say where something, R-E-G-E-X-P, and then a regular expression. And actually, I like to say are like. That's a synonym for, it's easier to type. So where something are like, and then a regular expression. Full regex support. It's good. IDEs, all these IDEs tend to have them. Even the syntax highlighting that the IDEs do, like Vim, Vim does syntax highlighting. It does it with regular expressions. If you go look at Vim syntax files, you'll see all these regular expressions in there, and that's how it figures out which things to color red and which things to color blue. And Lex, Lex is a classical, oh, we won't talk about Lex. <laughs> Let's go on, why? Why do we do this? So this, according to Doug McElroy, another of our famous founding fathers of Unix, incidentally, he is credited with Unix pipes, says, this is the Unix philosophy. Write programs that do one thing and do it well. I'm sure we've all heard that. Write programs to work together. Write programs to handle text streams, because that is a universal interface. And it's those last two sentences which are actually the most important thing he's saying here. <laughs> programs work together. Pipes, inventor of pipes, says programs work together. He's right. In Unix, you use one program and its output, you pipe it as the input to another program. And they work together. And why do they work together? Because chances are the output is text. This one uses text as its output. This one can read text as its input. They work together. Text is a universal interface. And why are regular expressions so handy? Because they're good at working with text. So if programs work together and text is a universal interface, and regular expressions are good with text, then regular expressions are fundamental to the Unix philosophy. OK. <laughs> How many of you guys have iPhones? Lots of iPhones? Only one iPhone, really? Well, Android? Oh my god! <laughs> okay. All right, all right. Okay, I don't actually know if this game exists for Android, but it, oh, okay, good. So, haven't lost you. This is a game. Let's draw something. How many of you people actually play draw something? Wow, really? OK, we got a few. We got a few. So anyway, just, just to give, for those of you who've never heard of it, you, you draw a picture. The picture gets sent with letters to the person you want, you're playing with. And that person has to guess what you drew. So here, it's really obvious they drew a cupcake, right? And the letters C-U-P-C-A-K-E are all down here. Well. OK, little story. I play this with my wife. She drew essentially this picture. I asked her to redraw it just for this lecture. Lecture, talk, whatever. And she did. She redrew it. And everybody knows what this is, right? You get it. You've already solved it, probably. I didn't. <laughs> I am ashamed. Sometimes you just have one of those days. I did not know what the little red arrows were pointing at. And even though I had the letters E-N-A-D-U-E-I-C down there at the bottom, I did not know what this was supposed to be. So what did I do? I cheated. I cheated. 
You guys know that there's a file on all the Linux boxes called user shared dict words, right? It's a word list. It's a very long word list. Comprehensive, if you will, word list. I hope you can see this. This is grep. It's actually egrep, which is a flavor of grep, but we'll just say grep. And here is a character class. One bracket and another bracket, and in the middle are my letters. E-N-A-D-U-I-C. The ones that I got on my draw something. And this is a repeat count. We talked about the star. These are curly brackets. And with curly brackets, you can actually say, I want exactly this many. And here's my hat to say the beginning, and here's my dollar sign to say the end. So when I did this regular expression against user share dict words, I got three, three answers. Audience, deadened, and unneeded, and it was audience. So I cheated. Regular expressions helped me cheat in my draw something game. All right, iPhone. You guys are Android users. <laughs> it's okay. I really, I really should be an Android user. <sighs> but yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm more the kind of guy who wants to jailbreak his iPhone because they told me I shouldn't. This is a jailbroken iPhone. Um, these are some of the processes you would see on an iPhone if you ran PS-EF. At least, that's what I see on my iPhone. Actually, this is my older one. I got a newer one since then, and some of the processes are a little different, but that's okay. So this is Ed. This is Ed running on my iPhone. This is an editor written in the late 60s, early 70s, and here I am using regular expressions invented in the 60s to edit a plist file on my iPhone because I want to turn on dynamic paging. Because the iPhone doesn't do swap, and I wanted mine to do swap. <laughs> so I just think that's great. Ed from the 70s on my iPhone. What is this, what, what actually is happening here? When I ran Ed on that file, all it did initially was to tell me 615. It read in 615 bytes. And then I typed two regular expressions. This regular expression says arg, and then there's a comma, and this, this regular expression says slash array. Now I'm using slashes before and after my array, before and after my regular expression. So when I want to match a real slash, I have to put a backslash in front of it. That's escaping again. And then here's a P. And this is the same P that's the P of grep. So this says, with a line starting with arg to a line with slash array, print them. And it did. This is what people would do on those teletypes. This is how they edited files on teletypes when they didn't have full screen editors. And you can still do it, and it works great on an iPhone because it's really hard to run VI on an iPhone. So then I said, all right, I'm looking for run, slash run. And it came back with run at load. And then I said, OK, I want to see the very next line. So I said plus one. And it said false. So then I said s slash false slash true. That says the regular expression false. Find it in the string and replace it with this string, true. And then just because I wanted to see that it really did what I thought it should have done, I said p, print the line. Sure enough, there's my true. So I say w, write out the file. 614 bytes written, Q, exit. So there, it's that simple. Regular expressions on a jailbroken iPhone. What fun, isn't that fun? <laughs> okay, I think it's fun, I had fun doing that. All right, so something a little more practical. Find, we all use find. Find is everybody's favorite for at least a while. <laughs> So this is me doing find on slash user. We're on a Linux box now, not on an iPhone. Find on slash user with dash ls. And here we are again with that idea of the universal text is a universal interface. Now find has a lot of predicates which you can use to say, I want you to only find these kind of files or those kind of files. But you know what? When you just say find dash ls and you get the long listing, 
you could say, I can see it. I can see what I want to match. Can I just say, match the things I see? Well, that's pretty easy if you use a regular expression. So in this case, I wanted to find the files that were, um, that had an, an end time in June of this year. Now, only of this year, because if it were last year, the LS would have put um, a year here instead of a time. And my regular expression actually explicitly has a colon for the time. So I'm saying June followed by one or more spaces. Now, this is a new one. This is a plus sign, OK? So we had the star. We had the curly braces with a number in between. Now we've got a plus sign. Plus sign is like star, but instead of zero or more, it's one or more. So that's a plus. So one or more spaces, then a digit, so character class zero through nine, so a digit, one or more digits, one or more spaces, one or more digits, a colon, one or more digits, and a space. And what does that match? That matches J-U-N, a couple of spaces, a digit, a space, a couple of numbers, a colon, a couple of numbers. Sure enough, I can see it, I can match it. And egrep is nice enough to colorize that for us. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Back in the old, bad old days, nothing colorized anything. All right. So I had to contrive some of these examples. This is a contrived example, I admit it. But it gives you an example, uh, an idea of what sort of things we can do. This is a CSV file from my little budget program. And I actually track where I spend things. And here's, you know, here's like the first four lines to just sort of show you what it looks like. And if I can see it, I can match it. So this is a little more than a year's worth of data. And if I wanted to say, how many times did I buy coffee over the last year? Starbucks, yeah, Starbucks, or you know, Dunkin' Donuts, I do that too. Uh, so I, I'm grepping for lines that begin with coffee. That, so begin, there's the carrot, begins with coffee. And this is what they look like. And I'm only limiting it to four here. So I'm going to get all the lines that start with coffee from my CSV file. And then I'm going to look for, and I want to count the ones that occurred only over the last year. So over the last year includes 2012. It also includes part of 2011. So I did this in two steps, first off. Here's a comma. This is the comma right here for this date. And then I said the digits 1 through 5. So that's January, February, March, April. And then a slash. And then one or more digits. And then a slash. And then a 12. And a space. And that's going to match something like 5 slash 25 slash 12. And that'll get me the 2012 part. But what about the 2011 part? So I need the last couple of months of 2011. So here, I'm using some parentheses. Because I want to say, I want to say 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. But 10, 11, and 12, those are two digits, not just one. So I'm using here a character class of 6 through 9, square brackets, and then an OR bar, and then a 1 followed by either a 0, 0 through 2, 0, 1, or 2. And I put that part in parentheses. So either OR will work. And then followed by some slash and some numbers and a slash and 11. And that will get me coffee from 2011. But I can put regular expressions together, right? I don't have to do this in two steps. So here, grand finale, drum roll, is the first expression that's exactly the same with an OR bar, and then the second expression. That's all that is. I just took the two together, and the numbers do add up. So 22 times in 2012, 30 times in 2011, 52, if I count them all together. A little bit of a contrived example, but this is some of the stuff you can do with regular expressions. Said, sort, and unique. How are we doing on time here? Not much left. I'm going to breeze through these. OK. We all know about syslog files, right? I wanted to say, who's writing the most lines in my syslog file? And in a given syslog file, the program will tell you which one it is that's writing the line. So here, I've got rsyslogd, anacron is writing some, 
what I can do is I can use good old awk and tell it to give me the fifth field. And awk, by default, will separate fields with spaces. So here's field one, two, three, four, five. So that's my fifth field, anacron, arsis log. But if I try and count these, they're hard to count because some of them have the process ID after them. I want to get rid of that process ID. So I use sed. And sed is just like ed, but you do it on the command line. So what I'm saying here with sed is I'm saying, first off, throw away the colon on the end of that field five. Then I say, take those numbers, zero or more of those numbers, surrounded by real brackets at the end of that field, and throw that away too. And when I do that, anacron bracket 4081 close bracket just becomes anacron. And then I can sort that. And when I sort it, I can run it through unique with dash C to count it. And when I get my counts, I can sort those counts in reverse, numerically. And then I can only ask for the first 10. And then I can see that in my syslog file, 14,834 of the lines were written by the kernel, 2,972 were written by network manager, and so on and so on. And this is something that actually is a little bit more useful in a day-to-day -day Unix world. And this is the sort of thing that you can do on one command line with regular expressions, with regular expressions. LSOF. How many people use LSOF? Yes. List open files. So again, LSOF, like find, has a ton of predicates that you can use, switches, command line arguments that you can use to say, I only want you to do this or I only want you to do that. But it's really hard to remember all those. And frankly, if I can see it, I can match it. And here, I can see it. So here, I wanted to say, show me all of the files owned by my processes that actually uh, are open file handles. So show me the open files of my processes, excluding the current working directory, the memory mapped regions, the libraries that are in use, and the other things that LSOF will also show you. And I did that with a regular expression that's just space, DG, that's me, space, and a number. And you can see egrep shows you what that matched in that output, DG, and then the number. And those numbers here, in case you don't know, this is the file descriptor. And this W afterwards says that it's a, uh, a writable. It's open for write. So let's go a little bit farther. Oh, I'm running low. Are we, are we supposed to? Oh, I've got until 6.15? Yep. Oh, we're golden. All right. Let's dig in then. <laughs> so here, we're doing a little bit more. This time, I wanted to use LSOF, but I wanted to ask the question, what are the files that are open for write on var log? And I don't remember why I wanted to ask this question, but I wanted to know the answer. I really did. Um, and that's less easy to do with the arguments to LSOF. I think it might be doable, but this is how I did it, because I could see it. And if I could see it, I could match it. So here, this is a new one for you, this backslash b. This is, this is not a literal b. OK, first, first non-intuitive one. A backslash b is actually a special matching tool which says to match at a word boundary. So a word boundary is essentially something that's alphanumeric on one side and not alphanumeric on the other side. And it's really useful. So I use that all the time. So I've got a word boundary followed by some digits and then a literal W followed by any number of characters, a space, and slash var slash log. And you can see what this matched in red from the LSOF, LSOF output. The word boundary matched right before the number. We have the literal number, a literal W, and then bunches of characters matched by the dot star, and then slash bar, slash log. And that works. So now let's say 
I really only want to see the process that has that file open and the name of the file. I want to get rid of all this stuff in the middle. That's also easy to do with sed. So sed, I'm using our s, and remember from our talk about ed, s slash a regular expression slash a string to replace the occurrences of that regular expression with. So this is my regular expression, and all it is is a space, the character class that is not slash, zero or more times. That's my whole regular expression. And all I'm replacing it with is a couple of spaces. So that matched this first space, and then all of these not slashes, all the way up to here, when there was a slash. And when I ran this output through said, this is what I got. I got the process, two spaces, and the, um, the file. <laughs> so sometimes, sometimes you're a perfectionist, right? You know, looking at this, this bugs me, because they don't line up, and I like them to line up. I'm either going to use something like a colon to separate things because I want other machines to read it, other programs, or I'm going to make them line up because I like them to line up if I want to read them. So here, I made them line up. This is the same idea. This time, I'm using awk. Awk is another fun tool, all right? But awk starts to cross the line. Arc, awk starts to become more of a programming language and less of just a Swiss Army knife. And Perl went way over the line. Perl was awk on steroids, and then Python was people who didn't like Perl wanting to do their own thing, and Ruby was people who did like Perl wanting to do something better. And you know, so that's where we are today, right? <laughs> so this is awk. And awk does the same sort of, oh, I mentioned this before, awk will let you breaks things up into fields all by itself. So when I say dollar four, I'm saying the fourth field. And with LSOF, that's, that's this one, the FD. Now this is some of the other things you might see in FD, but remember, um, we also saw numbers followed by a W to say that's an open file handle open for write. And that's what I'm looking for. I want the fourth field to have to end with a W. So that's what this says. The fourth field ends, matches this regular expression. And the regular expression, this time, conveniently enclosed in quotes, is W dollar. Now here, this is an and. Now this is, this is a programmatic and. This isn't a regular expression and. Like I said, we're starting to get into programming. Of course, regular expressions really are programs. It's all programs. It's all programs all the way down. Dollar <laughs> nine is the last field. And I want it, it to begin with slash var. And that's all I'm doing here. Two regular expressions, one on the fourth field, one on the ninth field. And here's where I pretty it up. I'm using a nice, good old-fashioned printf to say I want the first string to have 15 spaces to live in 15 columns. And sure enough, it does. So you can make it pretty. <laughs> you can even make stuff pretty. Oh, wow, we're almost done. When not to use regular expressions? Maybe. All right. How many of you would love to use these great new tools to search the web? <laughs> well, you could write your congressman, or you could write Google, but they don't do it for you. And it's not because they don't like regular expressions. The people at Google love regular expressions. As a matter of fact, one of the guys I stole that slide from earlier, the first history slide, was in charge of a project to do regular expressions at Google. But the only things they did the regular expression searching on was their code, um, their code crawler. So they used to have a crawler that would crawl source code. And you could use regular expressions to search that source code. I don't think they have it anymore. But, so they know regular expressions are good, but they also are kind of a lot of effort in terms of building up the indexes you would need to make them efficient for something as big as Google. And what Google says, and there's actually a video you can go watch uh, where a Google guy says this. They say there's not enough demand. 
there's not enough demand to do real regular expression searching on the Google page to justify them to build the extra indexes they would need to do it well. Now, I said contract, bad spelling. That's supposed to be contrast. Contrast this with glimpse. Glimpse is an, old but, an oldie but a goodie. It's one of my favorite little tools. What glimpse will do is it will take a whole directory tree and recurs it and build an index of the various, um, what would you call, you call them tokens, various strings that occur in all those files, and it'll make that index, and then you can search that index using regular expressions, but not directly. What Glimpse actually does is it takes your regular expression, breaks it apart, looks for real strings in it, goes and looks in its index to find the blocks from the files that have those strings, and then it goes to those files and runs the real regular expression on the file directly. And this is the sort of thing that can be done, that Google could do, but they don't. So if you want to do this sort of thing, if you want to run regular expressions over a giant tree of files, it can be done, and it can even be fast. And something like Glimpse is an example of how that's possible. But where, where else do we not really use regular expressions? Math, okay? You can't really add with a regular expression. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not pretty. For example, if you wanted to, if you had a, if you had a file of numbers, and you wanted to find the first set of lines containing in contiguous numbers in that file, that would be really hard to do with regular expressions. And even if you can do it, even if you're a glutton for punishment, it would be not very efficient. It's easier, frankly, to just write an old-fashioned program that says, what's this number? Okay, next line. Is that number one greater than this number? No. Okay, this will be my starting point, and so on and so forth. So math is kind of hard to do, really hard to do with regular expressions. XML parsing. This is, this is the stuff of holy wars on the internet. If you go look, you will find people who say that they can do perfect XML parsing with regular expressions, and then you'll find people that say that's a mathematical impossibility. Well, I'm gonna tell you what I think. I think if you know what the XML is supposed to look like, if you wrote the program that writes the XML and you got a pretty good idea what it's always gonna look like, or if you've got enough examples of the XML that you're pretty sure you know what it's always gonna look like, you, of course you can write regular expressions against it. It's just text. And as a matter of fact, it's a quick and easy and relatively efficient way to deal with XML. But XML, true, the full, truly generic XML, the world of XML and all the crazy stuff you can put in it, you can't write perfect regular expressions to completely handle all cases. So use, use regular expressions in XML when you have a pretty good idea of what it's gonna look like. IPv4 addresses, I see this all the time, it makes me laugh. I, you know, I, like I said, I work for a security company, right? And so, and Snort, which is a tool that uses regular expressions to search packets for bad things, lets you run regular expressions against these packets. And I see things like this, and this is what I call cheating. This is cheating. This is trying to match a dotted quad address and what it does, it uses a word boundary, and then it says one to three digits, followed by a dot, and that three times, right? So digits, dot, digits, dot, digits, dot, digits, right? That should work. Well, of course it does. It matches all legal, regular, all legal IPv4 addresses. It also matches a whole bunch of numbers which aren't legal IPv4 addresses, like 999.999.999.999. That'll be matched by this, but that's not a legal IPv4 address. So this is cheating. This is what you'd probably have to do if you wanted to match it properly. This is, uh, do you want me to go over it? <laughs> the first case handles 250 through 255. The second case handles 200 through 249. And the third case handles zero through 199. And that is all with or bars, and then a literal dot, and you can have three of those, and then one more of those numbers 
250 through 255, and so on and so forth. That will only match legal IPv4 addresses, but it's a pain. It's hard to write. <laughs> so do you use regular expressions everywhere? No, not everywhere, but lots of good places. There are lots of good places you can use them. Okay. This is the part where I throw in some extra stuff in case anybody's still awake. Or I say, do you want to ask me any questions? Or do you want to just call it a day early? <laughs> it's your conference. What do you want to do? Any? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> Thank you. Perfect segue. All right. I'll tell you about greedy versus not greedy. This is actually kind of important. That star, you remember the star, the Kleene star, which matches zero or more? Well, it's greedy. If you say dot star, it's not just going to take one character. It's going to take all the characters all the way to the end of the line, all the way to the end of the search string, the subject string. That's greediness. And all of the repeat operators uh, tend to be greedy. So plus is greedy. It will take all the characters to the end of the line if you say dot plus. Sometimes that's not what you want. You might have seen, or if you go back and look at these slides later, you might notice that I would use inverted character classes a lot. I'll say not slash star. And what I'm doing there is I'm telling it, you have to stop when you see a slash. Because the greediness would just want to keep going if I just use a dot. But there's another way to do it. You can use non-greedy. So non-greedy says, stop at the earliest convenient place, basically. So if I had said dot star question, question mark, that question mark is a, when it follows the star says be non-greedy. If I'd said dot star question and then some other part of the string, it would have taken the shortest number of characters until it could make the rest of that match. So that's non-greedy. We have greedy, we have non-greedy. And sometimes you can write things a lot simpler with non-greedy, but greedy was there first. Greedy is the original, and non-greedy is sort of the new and improved way to do it. There's also one thing I probably should tell you. Regular expressions in their modern forms are not necessarily, precisely, truly regular languages. Because we've actually come to the point of using them in our everyday lives and making them useful to us, of adding things that actually make them non-regular. But don't worry about that unless you're some math person. <laughs> OK. I've only got two other topics. Are we interested? Are they fast or slow? All right. Are they fast or slow? Everything is fast when your input is small. This is something, I'm going to say it was Rob Pike. It was either Rob Pike or Ken Thompson, all these other great guys. They have this, these, these bits of wisdom. And basically, one of the bits of wisdom is, when in doubt, use brute force. <laughs> and it, it really does work, in computing anyway. And use a fancy algorithm when your input's really large. But if your input is small, or if you don't know what size your input is, use something simple. Use brute force. So basically, if your input is small, regular expressions are fast. And by small, I mean megabytes, maybe gigabytes. If we're talking terabytes, you might want to think about that. So in the work I do with intrusion prevention boxes, we've got boxes that sit in a line in a network and inspect packets. And we see you know, terabytes regularly. We, we, you know, we see gigabytes every couple of minutes. It's a lot goes through there. And if you try and apply 1,000 regular expressions to every packet that goes through that box, it gets slow. So are they fast? Yes. 
Are they slow? Yes. <laughs> it's all a matter of what you're trying, how much you're pushing through it, and frankly, how complicated the regular expression is. Okay, last topic, how many flavors? Regular expressions have flavors. There is the original, uh, vanilla, <laughs> chocolate, no, no. The original, as in Ed and said, those are the POSIX regular expressions. Um, and they're good, but then there are slightly better ones. There's the stuff that comes with egrep, that's slightly better. And when I say better, I mean it makes it easier to write some things. The plus sign, for example, that's in the egrep version, not in the ed version. In the ed version, if you wanted to say plus sign, what you'd actually have to say is curly brace, one comma, close curly brace. That is the original way to say one or more. But they did so much of that that people, when they wrote egrep, they said, we want a shortcut. So plus is a shortcut. Then there's the Perl based ones. And these are sort of the holy grail. These are the really good ones that everybody likes and everybody uses. And that's kind of the best flavor. Um, I, I don't know what the best flavor of ice cream is, but Perl is definitely the best flavor of regular expressions. And typically you find that in all modern tools, when they say they support regular expressions, they typically will support Perl flavored regular expressions um, because there are really good libraries out there to do that and make that easy. So those are the flavors. And that's all I've got. That's it, that's the end, I think. Shall I check? Yes, that's definitely the end. <laughs> Any questions? Anybody wanna ask a question? Oh, okay. Hi. Hey, um, just an nitpick, really, but when you say uh, search in Google regular expressions, there's actually a site, DuckDuckGo, that you can, you can actually do that. No kidding. Yeah, so it's... Oh, that's the Google language? What? Is that the Google language? No, that'd be the Google code search. Oh. But um, DuckDuckGo is, it's written in Perl. Ah. And I'm a Perl guy, so this is kind of advertisement. <laughs> <laughs> Shameless. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, anybody else have a question? You have a question? Excellent. You're in the front of the class here, right? <laughs> Excellent. I, I thought you might know. Uh, I couldn't help noticing that you used the ampersand in the um, programming one. Why did they choose the plus sign instead of the ampersand? Why did they choose the plus sign instead of the I figured if anyone would know, you would know. That's wow. Funny. That's a good question. <laughs> well, you don't know. No, I don't know. Um, there are just about every character you can think of has some meaning or other in the really advanced regular expression stuff. Um, the parens, the brackets, the curly braces, the question mark, the colon, the dot, well, there's more, the backslash, and then you can put them together. So you can get things like open paren, question mark, colon, hyphen, yes, thank you, the carrot, that's, you know. So, why ampersand? I guess they felt, maybe they felt it was just one step too far. You know? <laughs> maybe they just drew the line at ampersand. I don't know. It's a good question, though. Anybody else? Any more? All right. Let's call it a day. Thank you. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the, uh, you know, of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, 
these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed. Is a I think that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Well, stack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack, as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. 
These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.